But while we're waiting for those questions to come in, let's get to some of the questions that have been turned in before, and hopefully it will not take too long to answer some of these. Number one, with so much about circumcision in the Bible, must um, males be circumcised to enter into heaven? It's amazing what a great problem that was in the first century. And uh, there were those individuals who really tried to bind that. They really thought that that was the answer. Many of them were Jewish in background. In fact, I would assume almost all of them were Jewish in background. And so they were binding circumcision. Well, to answer that question, all you got to do is just look at how the Bible discusses it. And in every place it is discussed, there is the negative answer. Look, for example, at three verses in the Bible. The first one, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 19. Must one be circumcised to, uh, uh, as a religious act? Listen to what the verses say. Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing. So there's your answer to the question. Must one be circumcised as a religious act? Absolutely not. It makes no difference whether one is circumcised or whether one is not circumcised. What matters is, is the keeping of the commandments of God. That's really, really what matters. In Galatians chapter 5, the same problem was discussed, for there were those trying to bind circumcision on the early Christians. And in, so in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 6, in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything, but faith working through love. And so there's the answer to the question of the Lord says, does it avail? Does it amount to anything? Absolutely not. As a religious act, it has no bearing whatsoever. And the, and the last time is over in chapter 6, where in verse 15, Galatians chapter 6 and verse 15, in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor un uncircumcision avails anything but a new creation. And of course, you think about that. If any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. And the Bible talks about being baptized into Christ, where one becomes a new creation. And, and the Bible says, and that is what matters. Let me point out, if you're in Galatians chapter 6, one of the reasons why this was being done Verse 13 says, For even those who are circumcised, for not even those who are circumcised keep the law, they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. Look back in verse 12. As many as desire to make a show in the flesh, to have some external religious manifestation that one might be holy, when it doesn't, account, doesn't amount to anything, he says, they desire, those who desire to make showing the flesh, they compel you, the Gentiles, to be circumcised only that they may not suffer persecution for the cause of Christ. And that in and of itself shows what the problem was. Those individuals were bringing about persecution upon those Christians, Gentile Christians, who were not being circumcised. Well, why, they were, why were they doing it? Because they knew that the, particularly the Jews would be persecuting Christians if they were not circumcised and they were a part of Christianity. They said, let's just compromise this matter. And, uh, you know, Paul says in Galatians chapter 2, we gave space, no, not even for one hour. Whenever that problem was being discussed in Acts 15, Galatians chapter 2, Paul says, it just, it, it, it just does not matter. Here's another interesting question. Why was Jesus born, hum, born human-like and not like a God? That's an interesting question. Why, whenever, uh, uh, did, when Jesus came on this earth, why, 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 was, was, he a, why was he human in form? Well, uh, look in the book of Hebrews in two places. Hebrews chapter 2, the Bible talks about the, in verse 14, that because we partake of flesh and blood, because you and I have a body of flesh and blood, verse 14, inasmuch as then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he likewise shared in the same that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. And so 
we have flesh and blood, and when Jesus was born, He took on Him flesh and blood so that He could die, and by death, he would, he would take away the power that the devil had. In fact, the book of Revelation says that whenever Jesus came out of the grave, he says, I have the keys to that place. Satan doesn't have them. In a figurative description, I have the keys to death and Hades. Figuratively, Jesus went into the grave, he went into the Hades, and he took the keys away from the devil. Not that the devil had absolute control of them, but he delivered those, verse 15, who through fear of death were all of their lifetime subject to bondage. Verse 18 says it another way, in that he himself hath suffered being tempted. Why did, not, why did Jesus not come as an angelic being? Why did he not come as God himself? Well, because he took part of the same in order that he might become something for us, and that is one who understands our suffering. That's what verse 18 is indicating, in that he has suffered, he's able to aid those uh, who are tempted. The other verse, if you're in Hebrews, look in chapter four, where the, the statement is, is made in relationship to Jesus, verse 15, we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with uh, our weaknesses. The double negative is a way in writing to, to shout out the absolute truth of the positive. When he says, we do not have who, a one who cannot sympathize, that's God's way of using this double negative to scream to every one of us, we absolutely do have a high priest who can sympathize with, with, uh, with our weaknesses. But he was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. So why did Jesus, why, why did he come as a human and not as, a, uh, uh, as a, a heavenly being? It is because that enabled him to destroy him that had the power of death and that enabled him to become, uh, uh, to, to, to become one to whom we can pray and we know that heaven understands our problems. Explain 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, to the, 9 through 11. Is there a waiting place before the judgment? Uh, look in 2 Peter chapter 2. I'm not even sure exactly what these uh, verses say. 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 through 11, uh, is not a place that discusses, uh, uh, well, let, let, let's read it together. 2 Peter chapter 2, then the Lord knows how to deliver out of temptation and to reserve the unjust under, under punishment for the day of judgment. And especially those who walk according to the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despising authority, they are presumptuous, self-willed, they're not afraid to speak evil of dignitaries, whereas angels who are greater in power and might do not bring a railing accusation against the Lord. Verse nine says, the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation and the Lord knows how to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. What does that say? Well, there is a day of a judgment that is affirmed that, that's happening here. And there are those who are unjust and they have a place reserved for them and they are reserved under punishment awaiting that day. There's a story in Luke chapter 16, I believe, that, that indicates this, and it's rather ironic. One of the cards left over from previous ones is the story of Lazarus and the rich man, a true story, or is it, it a parable? Uh, and then it asks, what is a parable? Look in Luke chapter 16, because quite people oftentimes read this passage and they want to make a parable out of it. Well, let me just say in passing, before we look at Luke 16, it does not have any of the markings of a parable. Parables begin by saying the kingdom of heaven is like. A parable is a figurative, is a story that illustrates a spiritual truth. Now a parable is not a fable. A parable is, is, a, a fable is something that could not happen. But a, but a, a, par, a, 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 a a fable is one that could not happen, 
And a parable is an earthly story. It's a reality. Think about Aesop's fables and how you've got all of these animals that are talking and doing things of that nature. That's not the, that's not the very nature of a parable. Look at Luke 16 and look at verse 19 where the Lord answers whether this is literal or not. Is this a true event? Jesus says, There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus. What does that tell you? If you'd been there that day, would you have thought that Jesus is trying to give you an earthly story that has some meaning far above all of these things? When Jesus says there was a particular man and that one particular man was rich and he fared sumptuously and there was another particular man, he was a beggar and his name was Lazarus. Both of these men died. The Bible talks about the angels carrying, carrying, a, a, carrying Lazarus to a place of bliss that is described as being in, in Abraham's bosom. But look at the rich man. Verse 22 says, He died and was buried and being in torments. Look at the word being. Is that not present tense? Here's that man who died. He was buried. But we understand what happens when a man dies, and that is the spirit is separated from the body. That's why death comes about. The body without the spirit is dead. What happens to that spirit? Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 7 says, The spirit returns to God who gave it. What does God do with that spirit? Well, we know what he did to Lazarus' spirit. The angels came and carried Lazarus, not his body, carried his spirit to a place of bliss. What happened to the rich man? When, when the Lord, as it were, received the spirit of the rich man, the Lord put him in a place. And so the Bible says, being in torments in Hades. May I point out that this is not the, the, the word that is used to describe the lake of fire and brimstone, the place of eternal, unending torment. In fact, the translators of the King James, or pardon me, of the New King James, did not even translate this particular word from the Greek but brought this word over letter for letter. Now, had this been the other place that you and I know of as hell, had they brought it over letter for letter, they would have said, and in Gehenna. Jesus talks about an eternal Gehenna where the worm does not die, and, and, and an eternal uh, Gehenna where uh, the fire is unquenchable. That's not what Jesus is describing. Jesus is describing what happened in the lives of two men, a rich man and Lazarus. And when the rich man dies, he was placed in a place of torments. Look at it as, as the statement says, and being in torments. I think it is interesting the word torments is not capitalized because it does not, it is not the name of that place. He was not in a place named torments. We do not know the name of that place. Some people want to describe this, the name of this place as Tartarus. There is a place in the Bible that is described as Tartarus, but there's no way to connect Tartarus to this story. And so, you know, they are those angels that sin that are in that place. But here's this man who is in torments. That's not the name of the place. That is the description. In the same way, when Jesus said to the thief on the cross, today you shall be with me in paradise. Paradise is not a name of that place. Paradise is a description of that place, and it means a beautiful garden. Today you will be with me in a paradise. 
So it's not, it's not a name of a place. It's a description of the place. Just like the place where the rich man was, the name of that place is not torment. The name of that, the, the word torment is used here as a description of it. And he says to the, to the thief on the cross, today you will be with me in a paradise. And he says to this, this rich man, he was in torment. What's, what, is, what, is, what is Hades like? What is this place where the rich man like? He lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I'm tormented in this flame. What happened to the rich man when he died? When the Lord received his spirit, he put that man in a place where there was torments and where there was flame. Somebody says, well, how do you know this is not the final judgment? Well, there's one other way because the question after uh, Abraham says to me that no way can one an individual go from one side of this place, Abraham's bosom, no way that one can fr- go from that place down to the place where there's torment. There's a great gulf that is fixed. Verse 26 says, and besides all of this, and besides all this, between us and you, there's a great gulf fixed so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to you. By the way, that gulf answers the question, did Jesus go down into into Hades and preach to those who are in Hades? The Bible says it is fixed so that those who are in the one place cannot go down to that other place. Now having said that, Having understood that, Lazarus said, I beg you therefore, Father, that you would send him, Lazarus, to my father's house, for I have five brothers that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Wait a minute. This is not the eternal hell because these people are still on this earth. His five brothers are still on this earth while he has, been di- has died and has been buried and he's in a place of torment, but his brothers are still alive here on this earth. That's how we know that that is not the Gehenna, the final abode of those individuals. Well, the question that comes out of this, and we might as well go ahead and answer it, let some will turn it in the next time. That is, then what's the purpose of the judgment day? If you already know whether you're saved or lost, what's the purpose of the judgment day? Even if you could not answer that question, that would not mean and negate, negate what the truth is has been revealed in these verses. The judgment day is not the day when God decides whether one is lost or saved. I want you to hear that right here on this earth. God knows who the redeemed are and those who are lost. Now, I think it's amazing that if the rich man could know that his brothers brothers were lost and headed for torment, surely God would be able to have that same knowledge. And so even the rich man was able to know that his brothers were lost. God looked down and here's this rich man who fares sumptuously and Lazarus who, uh, uh, who is a righteous man. God already knows about that. When God looks down at this earth right now, does he see the church and know what the church is? You know the definition of the word church. It's the called out. When God looks down, does He know those who are in Christ and those who are out of Christ? The division is already there. We know that God hears not sinners' prayers. When those prayers ascend up into heaven and sinners say, Our Father which which art in heaven, does God know whether those are His children or not? God already understands. God's already made the difference on this earth. When God looks at this, God looks on this earth and listen to this. God makes that judgment 
and gives blessings on this earth to those who are righteous. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3 says that God has given us all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. When God is ready to pour out spiritual blessings, they're found only in Christ. Now God sends the sun and the rain on the just and the unjust. He sends physical blessings without any line of demarcation between the righteous and the wicked normally. Whenever He does that, He makes no difference. But when it comes to spiritual blessings, the spiritual blessings are only given to those who are in Christ. And so right now, when God looks down, He sees the difference in the righteous and the unrighteous. He blesses the righteous and does not bless the wicked with spiritual blessings. God's already made a judgment, hasn't He? It ought not to surprise us at all that when a righteous man dies, God puts him in a paradise. And it ought not to surprise us at all when the wicked dies that he puts those wicked individuals in a place separate from the other, a place that is a place of fire. So the question is, is there a waiting place before the judgment? Absolutely. The day of judgment is the day when sentence will be pronounced. In our secular world, a man who is convicted of crime is put in jail awaiting his sentence. And we have no problem at all in the secular realm to see the wicked being put into a holding place that is in very, very much like the place where he will wind up once sentence is pronounced. And so there's a place of fire for, uh, 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 for, for, for individuals after they die and before they go to judgment. Look down at the next card and uh, uh, is it wrong to sue someone? Is it wrong to sue someone? That question comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We need to understand that there, that there is a difference between those who are our relationship to those who are Christians and those who are not Christians. Uh, go, before, well, let's go ahead and go to chapter 6, then we'll come back, David, to chapter 5 in just a minute. But in chapter 6, verse 1, there was a problem in the church at Corinth. Dare any of you, having a matter against another, go to law before the unrighteous and not before the saints? So here's the problem. In the church at Corinth, there were those who were having problems with their brethren. And Paul says, how can you be doing this? How can you go before those who are ungodly and ask them to bring about reconciliation between brethren? And so he says, do you not know that the saints will judge the world? I'm sure there'll be a question about that forthcoming someday. Do you not know that the, the saints will judge the world? And if the world will be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matter? Do you not know that we'll judge angels? How much more shall you not judge those things that pertain to this life? If you then have judgments concerning things pertaining to this life, do you appoint those who are least esteemed by the church to judge? There is a difference in the way the, the old King James reads and the way the new King James reads. But the point is this. If we're going to judge the world and if we're going to judge angels, how on earth do we think that we could not judge in secular matters? And so he rebukes them. I say to your shame, is there not a wise man among you? Uh, not even one 
who will be able to resolve this problem between brethren. Now, we need to understand that saints have an obligation to judge saints. Look back in chapter 5. In chapter 5, there was this man in the church, verse 1, who was guilty of sexual immorality. And he says, this kind of sexual immorality was not even named among the heathen, among the Gentiles, and that is that a man should have his father's wife. And so Paul in this chapter says, you need to deal with this issue. You see, here's the church, and you need to make a judgment about what's happening here. How was the church to make this judgment? In the name of Jesus, verse 4, when you are gathered together along with my spirit and with the power of the Lord Jesus, you give this immoral man, give him to the devil that his soul, his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Your glory is not good. Don't you understand that if you don't deal with this immorality that's there in the church, a little leaven will leaven the whole lump? And yet there, instead of dealing with it, were glorying evidently in the way that they were being tolerant of it. Verse 7, Purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump since you are truly unleavened. And so he says, in relationship to this, come together, give this man back to Satan that he may be ashamed that his soul might be saved. And that's why the Lord expects the church, ultimately, not on the front end, but as the end resort, as an end resort to withdraw fellowship. And that's why he says, don't even eat with this man. He's taken his father's a wife, and you come together and you say, we're giving this person back to the devil. That's more powerful than the way that sometimes we express it. And the way that we express it is, is, uh, is a biblical concept. We talk about withdrawing fellowship. It's far more stronger to say, this brother or this sister has left the Lord and they're living an ungodly life and we are here to give this person back to the devil. Now, not to get rid of him. This is not Catholic excommunication, and understand that. Whenever we, the elders, uh, uh, lead us in the announcing of the withdrawal from the ungodly, people, visitors oftentimes think that that's Catholic excommunication. Get rid of them. We don't ever want them to come back into this building again. Such could not be farther from the truth. The whole design is to bring this individual back that they might be ashamed. By the way, we don't have time to look in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, but guess what happened? This brother was restored. He gave up his sinful life. Now then, I want us to make the point of the difference we have in dealing with lawsuits in reference to the ungodly and lawsuits between brethren. Look in the latter part of chapter 5 when he says in verse 9, I wrote unto you in my epistle not to keep company with sexually immoral, yet I certainly did not mean with the sexually immoral people of this world or with the covetous or the extortioners or idolaters. Since then, you would need to go out of the world. Now I've written to you not to keep with anyone that is a brother who is sexually immoral or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or an extortioner, not even to eat with such a one. For what do I have to do with judging those that are outside? Do you not judge those who are inside? Therefore, put away this evil man from among you. And so the Bible commands us to make judgments about brethren that, that are wrong. And so the question is, is it, is, it, uh, is it wrong to sue someone? 
The Bible says when brethren who uh, have problems, they're not to use civil authority to try to solve these matters because the Lord said, or because this is the way it needs to, be, needs to be done by setting some wise individual in the church to bring about reconciliation. Uh, uh, in Luke, why did Jesus tell his disciples to buy swords? Interesting. In the upper room, and that's got to be in what, Luke chapter 22, is it? Uh, it's, on the, it's in the left-hand side of the page, and it's in, in the right-hand column on the left-hand side, if that'll help you find it, if you've got the same pagination that I've got in this. In Luke chapter 22, verse 35, he's there. The Lord's Supper has been instituted. He's dealt with all of these matters and he's trying to tell these disciples that you've got some really rough times headed among you. In verse 31 of Luke chapter 22, here's how tragic it is. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But I've prayed for you that your faith should not fail, and when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. This is Simon who said, though all men forsake you, I'll not forsake you. And whenever the Lord says, I have prayed for you, by the way, that's not, that word you is not singular, it's plural. I'm not just praying for you, Peter, Simon Peter, I'm praying for all of you so that Satan does not sift you like wheat. That's what happened, isn't it? You know, why, you know why you sift wheat? It's to scatter it. And Satan has prayed for you that he might take you apostles and just scatter you. That's almost specifically what happened in Gethsemane. And so the statement is, and because it's addressed to, to Simon Peter, that when you have returned to me, you strengthen the brethren. But he said, Lord, I'm ready to go with you both to prison and to death. And that's whenever he says, Peter, this night you will deny me three times. Now then, having said that, he says something else to them. When I sent you without money bags and knapsacks and sword, did you lack anything? And they said nothing. You see, he had sent them out before in Luke chapter 10. In Luke chapter 10, he sent 70 men out. And he says to them in verse 3, Go your way. Behold, I send you out as lambs among wolves, but do not carry money bags or knapsacks or sandals and greet no one along the road. And whatever house you enter, first say peace to this house. And if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest on it. If not, it'll return to you. Remain in that house, eating and drinking such things as he give you. For the labor is worth of his wages. Do not go from house to house. And so he sends them out on a limited commission. And he says to them, you don't have to worry about, about uh, being taken care of because God in His providence is going to take care of you. That was when the commission was limited. In a parallel sending in Matthew chapter 10, He told those individuals not even to go to the Samaritans. Do not go to the Gentiles. And so it was a limited commission. Now then, He is about to deliver to, deliver to them the Great Commission. And so he says to them, in order that they may recognize what a wretched situation was about to come on them. He'd already sent them out saying, don't carry a knapsack, don't carry money. I'm going to take care of you. But in the upper room, he says, back to Luke chapter 22, he says, when I sent you out before, did you lack anything? And they says, no, God gave us everything. Now, he says, it's changed. He who has a money bag, let him take it, and likewise a knapsack. And he who has no sword, let him sell his garments to buy one. 
For I say unto you that that which is written must still be accomplished in me he was numbered with the transgressors, for the things concerning to me have an end. Terrible times are ahead. And so he says to them, by a sword. Some have taken this was to say that every Christian needs to have sword. There are these 11 men that are there in the upper room. And so now let's arm ourselves. Look what's stated. When they said, well, we have two swords. And he said, that's enough. He is not commanding Christians to go out and arm themselves with swords to protect themselves. When they just had two swords, he said, that's enough. And so he's talking in a figurative way, not in a literal, literal way, that you ought to sell what you have and buy a sword and that, that uh, you know, every Christian ought to have swords while you're going out to do personal work. Then uh, you knock on somebody's door and if they won't let you in the house, then you take your sword out and chop your way inside that house. That's not what he's saying. He's trying figuratively to describe what a terrible thing were awaiting them. And so they only had two swords. It is interesting, is it not? We know which one, we know one of them that got one of the swords, don't we? It was Peter who said, I will never leave you. I'll go to prison and to death with you. And Peter said, let me have one of those swords. And when the mob came out, it's Peter who takes his sword and what Jesus tell him to do. Go ahead and fight. Kill all of these people. No, he says, put your sword up. And so this is not a commandment to go out and arm yourself. And he said to Pilate, did he, did he not? My kingdom is not of this world. For, it, for if it were, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered from the Jews. But my kingdom is not, is not that kind of kingdom at all. Great questions. I enjoy first, uh, uh, first Sunday nights and dealing with these questions. And I'm, I'm just amazed how many questions have come in. And uh, uh, the, uh, many of these questions will be uh, used uh, next time we have questions and answers. We'll try to get to some of these. And if your question didn't get answered tonight, put it in there again and it eventually will work its way to the top. I promise you that that is what will happen. Let's sing this song of invitation. Great question. Are you washed in the blood? Have you been washed in the blood? You see, the Bible says that believers, whenever they make up their minds to follow the Lord, need to arise and be baptized and wash away their sins. The blood of Jesus is that which will wash away your sins. When does His blood wash away our sins? When we arise and when we're baptized, the blood of Jesus washes away our sins. Now it's true that Christians if they're walking in the light as He is in the light, the blood of Jesus cleanses them. And so sometimes Christians need to come before the throne of God. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us. Cleanse us how? By the blood of Jesus. Is there sin in your life that needs to be dealt with? Some sin needs to be dealt with just in your own, as a child of God, in your own heart.